So now we've implemented our own sequence type. It behaves like a sequence. It is a sequence, the recursive list. The only trouble is we defined the recursive operations on the recursive list without using any recursion. We should probably fix that. So we have the len and the get item functions which are defined in terms of our constructor and selector. Well, let's write recursive implementations of the same thing. So the len recursive version is also going to return the length of s. Let's make sure we call the right function here. And the way it's going to do it, let me scroll down here is it's going to say if s is the empty r list. That's our base case. In that case, the length is zero. Otherwise, we'll return one more than the length of the rest of s. So a recursive list's length is just one more than the length of the rest of the list. Seems like a very natural definition. Can we come up with something equally rational for element selection? Uh, get item recursive is going to take a recursive list s and index i if our base case i is zero then return the first element of s because the index zero element is just the first element. Otherwise, well, we're going to decrement i and we're going to look at the rest of the list. And we would hope that this recursive implementation that we've just built also gives us two as the element at index three of alts, which is one, two, one, two. Let's see how we did. All of our tests pass. So we see get item rec is giving us two and len rec is giving us four. Look at all this. So now we have recursive implementations. Let's do one more example. Recursion is really an effective way to work with recursive lists. So let's say that I want to define a function reverse s. And what does that do? Well, it return s in reverse. So remember counts was one, two, three, four. Let's make the reverse of that, which is in our list four, three, two, one. So it should be the case that if I reverse counts, then that equals R. If we implement reverse correctly. Now think about re reverse yourself for a minute. See if you can figure out how to solve it. Well, I'm going to show you. And it uses a trick that's very helpful for your homework as well. You want to use the same trick in order to implement ping pong. And that is, you should call another function that tracks one more name than this one. So what reverse two is going to do is it's going to take the list that you want to reverse. And then it's also going to take the result of all the reversing you've done so far. So, so far we haven't done any reversing. As we make recursive calls to reverse two, result is going to have more and more of the reversed list. In fact, as a base case, if there's nothing left to reverse in S, then result will contain the entire reversed list. Now, if we're not finished, what we have to do is recurse on the rest of S but put the first element of s onto the result. 
So we return the result of calling reverse two on the rest of s. And then we build an R list, which starts with the first element of s and is followed by result. Oh, I forgot one thing, which is that I actually need to return the result of reverse two here. Now we can run our tests again, and we see that all tests pass. Excellent. So I want to do one final thing before we stop today's lecture, and that's to look at all the code that we've written so far. We have recursive implementations, iterative implementations, and some examples, and all of that is separated by an abstraction barrier from the implementation. So all of my tests pass right now. It should be the case that if I change my implementation, none of my other functions need to change. So let's say I discovered that the empty R list can't be represented by none for whatever reason. Instead, I need to write out empty R list as a string. Do my tests still pass? Yes, they do. Now something has changed. It's the case that the representation of counts now ends not with none, but with empty R list. But since I never really relied on the implementation anywhere below my abstraction barrier, I don't have to go down there and change anything. I could make even more drastic changes. I could put uh, an extra element into every R list, but then the rest is now gonna be the element at index two. I check my tests again, they still pass, even though it's the case that counts is now something entirely different than it was before. So being able to change the representation as we just did without having to change any of the functions that manipulate that representation is what I get when I install an abstraction barrier. Now this is just a comment. It's a conceptual change that I made where I just checked to make sure that I never relied on the fact that an R list was built out of tuples and instead just always use the constructors and the select.